check this on Facebook Live. Okay, so it's starting right now for Facebook Live, everyone. And let me go ahead and let everybody in from the waiting room. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this morning. As everybody's starting to add in, give everybody just a moment. Um, Dr. Martinez, welcome. Do you mind just checking your audio really quickly? I'm here. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, for jumping in on this call today. And um, we've got a few minutes. Everybody's going to start kind of adding in here and getting your audio set up. And then we'll get going. Okay, so we'll get this started in just another moment. Like we said, it is uh, broadcasting on Facebook Live as well. So welcome to you that have connected via Facebook Live. And everyone hopefully should be able to at least see the, the um, title screen for the, uh, for the PowerPoints that we're going to be going or kind of the different things we're going to be going through today. And let's see here. Okay. All right, well we're going to go ahead and get started and um, we've got a great group of people joining us today. So I want to thank everybody that's going to be on the call. Of course, thank you to uh, Dr. Martinez, the superintendent of Mount Alba Unified School District, and we have Senator Steve Glazier on the call today. So, Senator, thank you for joining us. And then, of course, we've got some uh, wonderful partners with the Concord Chamber, um, Visit Concord, and uh, a number of members of our city staff are joining us as well to share a number of the different things that are going on around the city of Concord right now. So, with that, we're going to get started. Um, so, of course, the general housekeeping things that everyone is used to is, of course, please, you know, keep muted if you can. We would appreciate you doing so. Uh, remember that if your video is on, we can all see you. Um, and uh, sometimes it's more comical than we would expect. And, of course, if you have any questions as we're going, please utilize the chat window uh, and we'll go ahead and stop and, and um, we'll go ahead and, and pick up questions as things come in. So. Again, go ahead and use the chat window um, as, as we're going along. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, kind of get started again with, I always like to start off with the thank yous to everyone. Um, again, thank you so much for everyone who stayed home and only gone out when necessary. Um, thank you to everybody who stepped up and volunteered. We've had a lot of people that have, have asked to get involved in some way, shape or form, whether it be delivering food for our senior program or our helping hands program. Um, or working with the food bank or Monument Crisis Center or the different agencies that are, are trying to help uh, make things work around the city right now. So thank you to all of those. And also thank you to those who made donations. We can't stress that enough. Um, there's definitely a lot of need out there. And so as things continue to unfold, um, we will definitely need your help. Um, so let's go and another big one. So we want to also thank our essential workers. And I want to give a shout out to Kevin uh, from the chamber. He's the CEO of the chamber. And he has done an amazing job um, between the chamber and Visit Concord and the city. We've put together some banners. And as you can probably see, they've gone up around the city in a number of locations. Um, and Kevin, do you, do you mind if, if really quickly, do you mind kind of giving us some of the locations those are, those are at right now that you, that you put them up over the last few days? Yeah, there's uh, the first location is near the Safeway sign, which is on Clayton Road and Tree Boulevard, Deckinger intersection. There's one um, at John Muir Hospital in Concord, right across the street. Um, there's another one uh, on Monument Boulevard, right uh, by where the skate park is as you're headed towards Costco. Um, that's, a, that's a good sign. And the last one we just put up Yesterday what is at Sun Valley, um, right below the Sun Valley Mall sign. It's an excellent location too. And then today um, we're going to put up um, two more. I got to give my shout out to Visit Concord Elaine and her team of getting these things done so quickly. That was cool, um, you know. And so you're going to see a few more throughout the community. We might move them around, but you know they're nice. 
people appreciate it, I think. You're muted, Tim. Thank you. All right. So next up, thank you for that, Kevin. Appreciate the uh, update on that. Um, the next story that's kind of a fun one, this is something that came up. I on Dablo, the beacon lighting is going to happen this Sunday. Uh, and the beacon is going to be lit every Sunday um, until the pandemic crisis is over. Uh, and this is something that, again, you know, especially for us, it means a lot. Um, it, it has a huge meaning, of course, when we do light it on December 7th. But this is also um, pretty symbolic for us being able to, to, to make this gesture and to have, um, to have this lit on the top of Mount Diablo. So I just wanted to make sure everyone saw that and was aware of that. Um, I felt that was pretty special. So let's talk about the current state as of today. Um, there's definitely a number of things that are going, going good. But you know, as you can see, um, we still do have, unfortunately, people being infected and people passing away as a result of this virus. Um, but in, in the city of Concord itself and, and this area, of course, the shelter in place is, is still happening. Um, hold on one second, sorry. Um, the, the city of the, um, the shelter in place is, of course, still happening. Uh, physical distancing is still extremely important. But the nice part to know is that, you know, in, in a way, it's working. OK, and so all we can tell people is just continue, please, doing what you're doing. It's not saying that we're ready to turn everything back on and everything's going to happen again. Um, but it's just that reminder that, you know, your efforts, your efforts are not in vain. And so while it's I get it, it's been a few weeks. Everybody's getting a little stir crazy. Um, and that's also why on the call later today we have fun things to talk about, like maybe some virtual recreation and other things that are kind of going around going on around the city that will help keep you busy at home. So that's kind of our plans. Um, but again, you know, let's just make sure people understand, hey, there's a lot of special events that are not going to be possible for most of this year. Um, and as we do kind of start progressing into what we want to think is normal life again, um, it's going to be slow and controlled. And I want to make sure everybody just is aware of that in terms of what this is going to, to look like over time. So some other things that are happening, of course, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has had a pretty significant impact on the city of Concord's budget. And I'm sure it's not just us. I'm sure that Mount Diablo and a number of other agencies are, are going to have, a lot of us are having to kind of step back and figure out what's going on, um, you know, fiscally right now. And there are definitely going to be a lot of challenges coming up. So I wanted to make you aware that we are going to do a fiscal state of the city presentation at the next city council meeting on April 14th. And then at the virtual town hall next weekend, uh, next Saturday, we're going to also bring that that um, that update to you as well, so that you can see what's going on, so everybody has a, a better idea of um, kind of just the general state of affairs and 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 what we should all kind of expect going into the later part of 2020 and into the next few years moving forward. Okay. And I would be remiss if I did not welcome our new chief, um, Bustios. Mark Bustios has been selected as our new chief of police. So a big welcome to him. He's going to be our special guest at our town hall next week. Give everybody an opportunity to, to meet him, ask any questions. And, uh, and so we're excited to have him. Of course, you know, it's a heck of a time to start. And uh, it, was, it was definitely, uh, it, it definitely anticlimactic in terms of the way that we got to bring him in and officially, um, Valerie got the opportunity to swear him in in the council chambers to, a, to, a, um, to an audience of his wife and Valerie. So, um, you know, kind of makes it a, a, you know, a little difficult, but at the same time, um, we do want to thank him and welcome him. And uh, again, we'll hear from him more next week. So I'm going to go ahead and let me pass it over to Valerie, and we have a few other updates to, to give to you. So this is Valerie, um, one of the uh, city manager for the city of Concord. One of the questions we get a lot is, you know, how are we helping the homeless and um, what outreach is being done to support them during the shelter in place? So I think most people know that the county has the primary duties and responsibilities in terms of supporting um, providing services to people who are unsheltered. But we are very close partners with the county um, in the city of Concord. We support a core team in partnership with the city of Walnut Creek that's dedicated to just our two cities. Um, and 
the core team is taking the lead of connecting with folks that are unsheltered, making sure they have services, making sure they get their medical needs, um, get, providing them with food. And then when appropriate, um, they have been distributing tents, which is unusual. They don't traditionally do that, but because there's a need and a desire to have social distancing, they've been using the distribution of tents to help people get a little further apart. Um, all agencies in the state of California have been told to not disturb camps during the shelter at home order, unless there's an immediate threat to life or safety of either the homeless folks themselves or other people due to how the camp is set up. Um, so you, I know this is something that's been very hard for many members of our community, um, but it's, it's a necessity in terms of not having to um, move, you know, when we disturb camps, it just means the individuals move around and establish camp someplace else because unless they get into shelter, there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, the city has placed four portable restrooms with hand washing stations at, they're at four different locations. One's at Civic Center, one's in Baldwin Park, one's at Hillcrest Park, and one's at Meadow Homes. These have specifically been set up to help the homeless population. Um, next slide. Um, and then a program I'm very proud of this council, the Concord City Council for establishing and my uh, team of employees, both in uh, our housing program, Brenda Kane, as well as, and Sophia, um, as well as our police department, uh, plus the core program is a hotel program for some of our most vulnerable unsheltered. Um, so the first thing I should make sure everybody knows is the program's full from the perspective of the amount of resources we have to support it. But the goal is to keep people in the shelters at the hotels um, as long as the shelter in place is in place. Um, currently it's through May 3rd, but we are assuming from a financial perspective that it will extend until the end of May. Um, we have 32 people um, distributed between 14 hotel rooms. Most are families with either young children or an adult who's very compromised and at risk. Um, we were successful working with CORE, moving one family who started in this program um, into permanent housing, and one pregnant adult has already also been moved into permanent housing. CORE's goal is always to move these individuals into permanent housing when it can be done. Um, and then in terms of who gets identified and chosen to participate in the program, it's done through our CORE um, our core partners because they know the community better than um, any of the staff in the city of Concord and they know who has what needs and who will be successful in the program. Um, so we've been really lucky and fortunate with this program. And as I said at the beginning, the program is full. Next slide, Mayor. Um, so CORE provides case management to the families and the individuals and visits them every day, delivers them food from the food bank. We've also set them up with the city's Expanded Meals on Wheels program, which is another program that I'm very proud of this council for uh, establishing. And um, the Meals on Wheels delivers food daily. ProCan Labs partnered with us because some of the hotel rooms did not have microwaves available for these families. And in order to heat up the Meals on Wheels, meals, they needed microwaves. So ProCan Labs donated microwaves to the program um, so that we could continue to feed people and have the food be warm. Um, council members have indicated they want to begin fundraising to support this program and expand it. And the donations would be handled through the TSBA Arts Foundation, which is a 501c3. Um, and I think you'll see that roll out next week. Costs for a hotel room and food for a family are about $140 a night and for an individual are about $125 a night. So we're hoping the community steps up and helps us raise some funds so we can expand that program. I think that's it, right, Mayor? That is, thank you so much, Valerie, for that update. Um, we did have a, a question or two about some of the different uh, porta potties, hand washing stations. Um, there's been a number of them put out throughout the community, though. But do you mind just giving a quick update on? Um, I know there's a few locations at this point in time. Um, is there any plans for expansion of that? What does that look like right now? So we have not been successful in obtaining any more hand washing stations. So it, um, we're still working on it. So it's possible it could be expanded. Um, but at this point, I don't have hand washing stations to put out. And um, 
based on advice from the um, county, we don't want to put out porta potties without the hand washing stations. Okay, thank you for that update. Uh, I know I know that's come up a number of times, and I know a number of agencies have actually been trying to get hand washing stations. So it's actually been definitely a problem. Um, uh, and then another question, uh, will the donations be used to acquire additional hotel rooms in an effort to assist additional individuals and families? Yes. Um, and so um, the reason why we went ahead and put in that information about the, art, the, the foundation is that is the foundation for the city of Concord. And 100% of those dollars just passed straight through to be able to support um, some of the expanding, trying to expand some of these additional programs for individuals and families. So that's exactly what it'll be. And I know that um, I will say that uh, Visit Concord and Elaine and her team is also helping us kind of stand up a, a landing page for that so that uh, hopefully we can have something put together by next week. Okay. Yes, and, and if I may, Mayor, this is Elaine Please. with Visit Concord. And, uh, you know, we're in constant contact with the hotels um, and they are just very appreciative of this, of these efforts and say that these um, homeless families are just wonderful families trying to get, uh, you know, trying to survive and really are appreciative of everything that's been given to them. So, um, yes, this is something that we'll be working on to, to make sure that we look for these donations to continue these program, both the hotels and the guests are very happy with this program. So thank you for that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you to Visit Concord. So just a few other, you know, kinds of constant reminders is of course the City of Concord website will have your most up-to-date information in terms of coronavirus, as well as different links um, that will be important, whether it be links to some of our different resource sites at the County Health, um, Mount W Unified to the Concord Chamber, Visit Concord, um, but also um, places like EDD. Uh, and then also within that, there are some additional places um, that are on the City of Concord website that our Economic Development Department has gone ahead and stood up um, to make sure that everybody has the resources they need. So there's definitely a lot of good information out there. Just want to continue to make sure you're aware of that. And next up, we have uh, Demma Darner. She's from our, our recreation. She's our recreation coordinator for the city of Concord. So um, she's going to talk to us a little bit about virtual recreation. Devin? Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, can you guys hear me OK? Yes, First? we can. OK, perfect. OK. Um, so with the shelter in place order in effect, um, Parks and Rec was hit especially hard having to close and all of our facilities and cancel all of our in-person classes. Um, we noticed a trend many agencies were switching to virtual rec in order to continue to serve their communities. Um, we also did this. So um, we're doing our best to get something out for everybody, whether it's science or scavenger hunts or city challenges and workout videos. Um, some of our class instructors are actually filming their own at home workouts so you can follow along with them as well. Um, and some of the, the classes that we're offering are jazzercise, fit and low, um, flip, fit and low stretches, ballet and line dancing. And all of these classes right now are free and available online. Um, and then some of our most well received options that we're offering right now is our preschool story time and craft which we're doing Facebook live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 11am. Our baking challenge was really well received as well as our camp from home challenge. And we're also putting out information on how to use our park safely during this time. Um, upcoming um, with Earth Day and, out, um, and Arbor Day right around the corner, we're gonna be sharing some more information on how you can celebrate at home in your backyard with crafts and activities for youth and adults. Um, so make sure to check out the website if you want more information and my email is on the screen if you're looking for something in specific that you wanna see on a virtual recreation site. All right. Thank you, Devin. Thanks for that update. Um, and any other questions, don't hesitate to uh, email her. It's devin.darner at cityofconquer.org. Uh, again, on our website, you can see the uh, check, check out the different programs that are going on. Uh, I got to really hand, hand it to our, our park and rec staff, who's done a really good job about standing up a lot of kind of fun, interactive programs for everybody at home. So next up, we have Lisa Potvin. She is our new downtown program manager, but going to talk to us about some other fun programs that the City of Concord is doing. Yes, thank you so much for having me on today. We launched Concord Live, a virtual event series about two weeks ago, um, and we've been gearing this towards some of the adults in our community, a fun way to engage Thursday nights, 6 p.m. They're all um, tied into our local businesses, 
um, to kind of remind you of who's still out there, what they're doing, and ways you can have fun at home. So this week we had Lima doing a mixologist class. Um, it is still live on the City of Concord, California's Facebook page. Um, so you can still go on there and make some of your favorite Peruvian drinks. Um, this upcoming week, April 16th, we have an at-home cooking demo with the chef from Luna. So all of the ingredients you need are available on our Facebook. You can go buy them and cook along with him, ask questions as he's going. April 23rd, we have an at-home concert with Daniel Morris. He's a phenomenal uh, viola player, but he plays the classical instrument to um, hip hop songs. So you'll hear it played to the Chainsmokers, John Legend, Post Malone, all those um, kind of fun, upbeat things. And April 30th, we are partnering with the Concord Art Association. So you can kind of grab some wine, paint a little bit, have some fun. All right. Well, that sounds awesome. I know there's definitely a lot of people excited about that. And uh, I mean, you've got some great chefs that are going to be uh, doing some of those cooking demonstrations. I'm excited, especially the person that's on there now, Habib from, uh, from Fiore and Luna. Um, he, uh, he has a lot of fun doing that. So that should be yes. fun and to he's check gonna out. going to be teaching a stuffed mushroom with crab meat for the appetizer and a penne for the entree. Oh, very nice. Love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. And a few other final reminders uh, that are going on with the city of Concord, just to make sure everybody uh, is aware of this again, the Concord Cares program, our senior emergency food program and helping hands program. Again, it is for homebound seniors with any kind of food insecurities. Again, this program is completely free. It will run uh, through at this point, May 3rd. And if needs, if it needs to be extended, it will go beyond that. And then also helping hands for those who need some additional deliveries uh, to their home. So again, there's two ways to access it. It's either uh, neighborexpress.org or you can definitely uh, have people give them the phone number at 925-338-1441. So I also want to do, I want to give a shout out to the volunteers that are behind the scenes with this program. Again, this is our, our, our VIPs, our volunteer and police service uh, folks who actually help man the phone line to handle this and to be able to take, take people's questions. And they've done a really, really great job um, being able to kind of intake folks, help find, you know, not, and, and a lot of people that call in may not necessarily sign into the program, but they've been great about helping connect people with resources as they go along. So again, thank you to those volunteers that are helping make this program work. Um, again, uh, Valerie touched on this earlier, the temporary eviction and rent moratorium. Uh, just a, a reminder again of what's going on around this. Um, the cityofconcord.org slash housing has additional information. And you can see there's a few phone numbers here, but again, cityofconcord.org backslash housing, you can find more information about the different programs as it relates to temporary evictions and rent moratoriums. There's definitely a number of questions that have come up. So there's a number of phone numbers here that if you have questions, uh, please give us a call and we can go ahead and, and try to get those, get those solved. And the last piece to remind everyone is the Concord Connect mobile app. If you haven't downloaded it already, it's something you should definitely take take a chance to take, take a look at. Um, there's a lot of good information here, but I know, of course, one of the things that we get asked a lot about is what's going on with people that may be doing things, businesses that are open or people that are convening events that they shouldn't be. Um, under the police department tab, there is a very specific place in there to be able to um, actually kind of let us know that these things are happening and we can respond accordingly. All right. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Senator Steve Glazer. Senator's on the phone with us. Uh, welcome, Senator, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mayor uh, McGallion, and, and thank you to your council and your staff and all the wonderful volunteers in Concord making our world a little bit uh, more comfortable, even though it's upside down. Uh, you have so many great uh, nonprofits and uh, groups really making a difference in your community. I uh, want to particularly give a shout out to uh, the wonderful food bank of Contra Costa and Solano counties and the, the Monument Crisis Center who are just doing unbelievable things every day to help feed people and, uh, and make, the, again, their life as comfortable as it can in a very difficult uh, circumstance. Uh, you know, I have uh, done a series of, of town halls just like you're doing right now, Mayor, um, 10 of them so far uh, with, with my Senate district to 
to talk about things that people are worried about, concerned about everything from grocery shopping and whether or not the supply chain is intact to how to deal with your pets. Uh, we uh, did a, a town hall on small business. So many small businesses are being hurt so, so substantially by many of them having to close. Um, and of course, the people that have lost their jobs in California in the last three weeks, uh, over 2 million people uh, have gone to, uh, to uh, claim unemployment insurance. And uh, all these things from the federal support for business to unemployment claims, there's a bureaucracy there. People are having some difficulty uh, getting their, their claims uh, attended to. Uh, and so we're working very hard to try to get information to people in terms of how to do those types of things. So if any of these, you see the, the, the PowerPoint on your screen there, any of these issues of interest to you, uh, you want to uh, hear directly from experts on those subject areas, you should go to my website uh, where uh, each of those town halls have been taped and people can go and, and check it out. Um, but you know, the, the, the news out there, it's, it's very troubling, yet, yet there are some bright spots. And let me, let me mention those. In the, in the world today, over 1.7 million people uh, infected. And that, that is a low number because of the lack of testing not just in the United States, but around the world, the number of people infected is very understated, but a third of those uh, are in the United States, a third. Uh, worldwide, over 106,000 people have died. Uh, and uh, unfortunately today, the United States uh, uh, exceeded the death toll of Italy for those who have perished in our country. Uh, it's over 2000 people a day uh, in California, uh, we have a, almost 600 people have died from the coronavirus, uh, nine in Contra Costa County. Um, and the key issue for us is uh, in this physical uh, distancing requirement uh, is to slow the spread of this virus. It, it only is spread because people, it, from person to person, um, and that physical distancing is the key to slowing it down. And where we look to see acutely where we're making a difference is in the issue of hospitalizations and beds in our, our uh, intensive care units. And that's where there is some uh, good news out there in that the curve that's been growing so quickly uh, in our state and in our country uh, has slowed down in California, maybe more so than almost any state in the union. And so uh, the Bay Area leading on, on physical distancing uh, and, the, and the state following, and then many states around the country following, that we are bending our curve right now because of the work that we're doing, which means uh, that it's gonna put less pressure on our hospitalization systems, uh, that we know if someone does get sick and there are about 25% of the people who have COVID-19 don't show symptoms, which means they're not getting sick, which means they can spread it uh, uh, inadvertently. They're not walking around coughing. Um, but it means that we have to slow down that spread so that if they get, if people who do get sick uh, can be cared for appropriately in our hospitals. And so there's some real positive news out there for California, for our area. Uh, yes, there's some in intense hot spots in Contra Costa County right now, um, but that's why physical distancing is so, so very important. So there's a lot of impacts. I know everybody listening to this and watching this, uh, your personal stories, they're, they're uh, they're, they're very, very difficult. Um, and certainly, as you talked about, those who are homeless, those that are elderly, uh, so much greater risk uh, that the, it's a scary, scary time. So I just want to let you know that I appreciate, we appreciate the great leadership of, of you all in Concord, uh, caring for those in need, trying to find a way for everybody to uh, cope with this, to volunteer, uh, that all these things um, are making a difference. Uh, and together we will get through this. And Mayor, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and your constituents this morning and happy to answer any questions. Sure, thank you, Senator, I appreciate that. You can see up on the screen is some contact information for the Senator and his office. Um, but we appreciate you taking the time to uh, come in and chat with us today. Um, I will definitely go ahead if, if there's a question or two that um, anybody would like to ask. Um, I'd like to ask a question on behalf of somebody who put it on the chat line. Uh, Senator, this is Valerie Baroni. Um, one of our residents wrote, 
um, that the governor talked about work that is being done to support nursing homes and assisted living communities. She would like to know what is being done to support senior independent living communities. Well, we've identified all of those areas as, as, uh, as particularly important because of the vulnerability of the residents there. So in the case of the health facilities, uh, assisted living facilities that have uh, infections, the state is now stepping in with their, uh, their medical uh, workforce to join in with the county to try to make sure that those in those places are being taken care of. Because it's not just the residents that have gotten sick. In the Arinda senior facility, uh, over half the people there, I think it's up to 24, were staff members who uh, got COVID-19 in addition to a, about 25 or so uh, seniors that are there. And that meant that the ability to take care of those residents, either healthy or not, uh, was put in serious jeopardy. So uh, the governor's recognized the vulnerability of all types of senior assisted living uh, spaces and uh, has prioritized the distribution of resources and of staffing and of help uh, in those places. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, and then Valerie, are there any other questions that may have come in or anybody else have a, a question for the Senator? There is a, another question here from um, Wayne Calhoun. And I don't know if the Senator would have the information because it's probably a county question. Um, but the question that was typed was, why does the county heat map for homelessness indicate there is zero homelessness south of downtown Walnut Creek? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. The county may know that could just be a, uh, I, I think that those of us who have traveled in that area would be surprised to, to see that and hear that. And we do work hard to try to keep a good count of where the homeless are living uh, for a variety of, of, of good reasons. But I don't know specifically on that, uh, that, that concern. And then another question that came in through the chat is, is it possible to get a list of the nursing homes and assisted living facilities that have been impacted by the virus? Well, that information is provided by, by Contra Costa County. They are trying to be careful about protecting people's privacies, uh, but they have identified uh, an, uh, a senior facility in Pleasant Hill and in Arinda where there has been an explosion of cases. I'm not aware of any other being specifically identified, but my suggestion would be that maybe through your city leaders, uh, the city manager's office, that uh, if, there is a, if, if there is greater disclosure, that they could provide that to you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, another question that came in was around child family child care providers for um, are there any is there anything being done specifically for child care providers um, any other services or dollars available to those people to be able to stand up uh, additional services what does that look like right now well um, so the governor spoke about that uh, over the last couple of days and he has uh, added uh, child care to the list of places where he's given special attention. Uh, that there is a, uh, an effort now to provide more personal protective equipment, we say PPE, uh, to child care providers as more of those resources are coming uh, into the state. Um, he's providing uh, financial resources to help uh, uh, clean uh, places, child care centers, to help keep them cleaner uh, and protect uh, the kids that are there. And he's providing some subsidies for health care workers who need to have their children and child care to, prove, to help them financially uh, and, and, and allowing them to be able to, uh, to do their job. So uh, child care is such a, a critical element in, in regular life, let alone if you're someone who's a, a frontline worker now in this, in this crisis that we're trying to support the centers uh, in particular for those uh, who are first responders and who are healthcare workers so they can uh, be able to do their job and, and have their kids be properly taken care of. So it's another stress point in our whole social safety net. Uh, it's, it's there in normal times and it's particularly there now. And the governor's indicated that he is directing the resources that the legislature has provided to him before we uh, recess the Senate uh, uh, passed a, a, an ordinance giving him over a billion dollars to help uh, in these types of situations. And he has directed that money, some of that money to childcare. 
Got it. Uh, a real quick follow up to that, just so that we can connect dots. Um, if we do have a child care provider or someone involved in child care, where is the best place for them to kind of access that information or if there's funds available to be able to, to kind of just connect those dots? What would that look like? Uh, so the, the way that the, the system works is that the state uh, directs resources to the county in most cases. So Contra Costa County uh, is the recipient of a lot of the resources that are being directed, whether it's to uh, homeless, uh, whether it's to the uh, healthcare systems, and whether it's to childcare. So uh, they are typically the point of contact. I don't know specifically how that money, the governor just announced it, I think it yesterday, how that money is going to flow down. But my suggestion would be uh, for uh, any kind of child care provider is to make a contact at the county. They're welcome to call my office. In fact, there's phone numbers on the screen there uh, that you can call my, uh, my office and I'd be happy to uh, help direct you uh, to where that, that information is. That would be perfect. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Can I ask um, a question? Oh, sure. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark McNeil. Senator, thank you for joining today. Um, I am not part of the city council or any of that infrastructure, just a concerned citizen. Um, quick question I have is, what is the criteria that the governor is going to use to remove the shelter in place order? And I say that because you mentioned physical distancing, um, which uh, obviously helps, but I don't think you need to have a shelter in place order if you do physical distancing. And I think you can look at the numbers at the, the city level, the county level, and to some extent even the state level and say we have flattened the curve uh, with new cases and, and deaths and we are, we're not being hit nearly as hard as other areas of the country. Um, we established the shelter in place the, about the same time as New York did. New York, unfortunately, has, uh, has been hit extremely hard. I think there's other factors that come into play in California, like maybe people had it long before the shelter in place and developed communities. So I wonder what the criteria is for the governor to open that up and take that restriction off, or if it can be done by area, by county, because we're looking at a million people unemployed here just in the Bay Area, and that, that's gonna kill yeah. the economy. Well, Mark, thank you very much for your question. And it's the most common question that I get uh, from people, because obviously the impacts are enormous on people, on business, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and let me just correct a, a, a factoid. Uh, California was well ahead of New York. I think by five or six days. And the Bay Area was three days ahead of California. So uh, the decisions to shelter in place was not a decision made by the governor. Uh, it was a decision made by our public health officers in Contra Costa County in conjunction with the health officers of the other Bay Area counties. They were the ones who looking at the, the infection, the virus, the consequences, the difficulty of containing it that made that choice. And it's very likely that they will be the ones focused on public health first to uh, provide the, the changes that will hopefully occur as soon as, as possible to uh, uh, relax those requirements. Does that mean that there is no criteria because our, our hospitals aren't overwhelmed there? In fact, many hospitals have a lot less patients in them now because they're not doing elective procedures, right? So I, I just wanna try to understand because the governor mentions a model and things when he gives uh, press conferences and the model has been proven to be incorrect many times. And he's saying now the peak will be mid-May, which I don't think is correct, but what are those criteria that will be looked at to say? Cause it's yeah. the hardest thing for us out here, Senator, is not knowing and even yeah. not having a goal or seeing the end of this. And, and I fear that the cure may be worse than the, than the disease. Right. So uh, a part of that analysis is, is having a, a, a good examination of the infection rate uh, in the community. And that's where we've been flying blind. You know, the, the testing has been a complete disaster, not just in California, but across the country. And that is meant for public health officers that knowing how, how, how great that infection is, uh, makes I it very totally difficult. agree. I think we really need to put money into testing, but is there money going into testing that as well? I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's a great, great point. Yeah, so, uh, so part of the challenge has been to the, the lack of availability of testing. And what we are seeing now is that uh, testing has improved, but it can still take you uh, three or four days, even in the hospital, to get a result back of whether you're COVID-19 positive or not. I but think it's more... Just a, it just a minute, Mark. Hold on, Mark. Let me finish. Hold on, Mark. We got um, it. 
Uh, but there are some new tests that have been developed by Stanford University and others that can allow a, a blood test to determine whether or not you have had an infection or not, uh, and whether you have those antibodies in your system, which uh, gives some indication that you may be safe. Until we as a country have what's called herd immunity, meaning that en enough people had infection and survived to not allow the transmittal of that virus to be as quick and as easy as it is today, uh, it's gonna be very difficult uh, for the health directors to make the best choice. Mm -hmm. But what they are going to be looking at is the infection rate, is the hospitalization rate, uh, is the death rate. All those things go into their calculations in determining whether or not it's safe to relax the physical distancing requirement. But let me explain one last factoid that's very important about this virus, and it's so much different than anything that we have seen. And that is, is that 25% of the people who have it don't know that they have it. They're what they've called asymptomatic. And that means they think they're healthy and they can go out and talk to people and do things and uh, because they have no sense that they are a carrier and they can infect others more vulnerable than themselves. And that's an insidious part of this particular coronavirus that has made it very, very difficult and has made the public health community height, height, with heightened sensitivity about the fact that if we're gonna actually uh, uh, contract and uh, prevent the spread, that it's gonna take serious, serious uh, uh, requirements from all of us that which we're experiencing today. But here's the thing, Mark, we got to count on our public health officers to make those choices, not a bunch of politicians in a room saying, we don't want to hurt people. We don't want to hurt business. They're trying to make the best choice for us. I think that they've been courageous in what they have done, despite the enormous hardships that you and I are experiencing. I think you can't really separate the two though, Senator. And it's kind of a catch 22. You mentioned herd immunity, which obviously is a huge help down the line, but by sheltering in place, we'll never develop a herd immunity. So and there's a huge portion of the population that will get it and have little to no symptoms, like you said, and that's where the herd immunity is developed, right? And I think there's a way to still protect those that are most vulnerable, right? Elderly, people that have underlying conditions, those that we know are very susceptible to it, yet still relax the shelter in place and be able to use physical distancing. I I'm aware there are idiots out there running around doing things that are just stupid, playing basketball games and doing things that are, that are exacerbating the situation. But I think at some point we have to trust the population to be able to go back to work and still fight this, right? So I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's, it's a catch 22 right now. And if we had antibody testing, uh, at least we could tell who had that immunity and could go back to work. But I, I think we've got to figure out how to not just have the health officials work on that because they may not be aware of the, the economic implications, right? So I'm, I think we're looking to you and the governor and those that are in charge to make wise decisions and not just leave it up to the doctors because the doctors don't always get it right either. So thank you for your time, Senator. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank you for that. And again, thank you, Senator, for joining us today. Um, we do appreciate your time. Thank so you we're going to go much. ahead and again, thank you guys for that. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on to uh, our next um, item here. So um, what I'm going to do is just kind of run through some, some additional reminders, some resources that are available. Um, specifically, of course, here is the dashboard. Most of you are probably familiar that the Contra, that Contra Costa County is kind of having a running dashboard of what's going on around the county, other good information as well. The other thing the county did release this last week was, of course, the updated dashboard with city-specific data. Uh, and so that information is, is available. I know a lot of people are very curious about that piece. Um, and so that information now is being released. And then of course, I can't stress this enough and you've probably seen this all over about uh, being able to wear some kind of bandana or mask or protective face, face uh, gear while we're going out. Again, this is something that is extremely helpful um, while, while we're out, all out in public. Hey Tim, a quick question. Um, sure, go ahead. Is there a, there's, I, I saw your dad, I see the dashboard all the time. Is there, um, there's no column for deaths in a given city. That's, that's on purpose. I assume they're just doing the cases. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, emergency food resources, of course, this is stuff that we constantly want to make sure gets reminded to people about where resources are in our community. Um, the senator touched on the Monument Crisis Center. They are doing a fantastic job uh, really helping support folks around the city. And we have another, a few other organizations as well, but continue to want to make sure that you are aware of these so that if you can pass this on, we'd greatly appreciate that. So on Monday, April 13th, and then Tuesday, April 14th, um, there are food distributions happening. Also at the Park Haven Community Church, every Tuesday from four to six, they also are doing emergency food. Um, and then of course the grab and go, and I know even Dr. Martinez will talk about this a little bit more, but of course Clayton Valley High School, they're doing it Monday through Friday from 10 to noon. Uh, and these sites in Concord at Mount Devil Unified, uh, Cambridge Elementary, Metal Homes, El Dorado, Mount Devil High School and Ignatia Valley all will be doing um, grab and go food lunches. So, and these are of course for children ages 18 and under. Okay, so next up, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Robert Martinez. He's the superintendent of Mount Devil Unified School District. Also somewhat new to the job. So welcome to, um, you know, one very challenging first year uh, at the <laughs> helm. And, uh, but I think there's a lot of people on this call that, are kind of in that same boat, right? So uh, again, thank you for joining us and um, please go ahead and thank you. Uh, it really is my pleasure to be here uh, with everybody this morning and just to share a little bit of the information about our amazing uh, Mount Diablo Unified School District. Uh, you know, it is uh, my first year and we're, you know, about eight months in now into uh, taking over the district and working with the amazing educators across our district to serve our over 30,000 students. Um, and, you know, while we were already undergoing some uh, financial uh, review of situations, trying to make sure that we can meet the needs of our students uh, for curriculum pieces, for the educational services level, uh, none of us were preparing for this level of significant uh, dramatic change uh, to our school year, quite frankly. Uh, and so what we've had to do uh, when we took the action uh, back in the middle of March to in essence close for several weeks uh, to get us to the spring break. We did that on behalf of, again, working with our public health officials, our county officials, um, the information from the state, uh, and really taking a look at, again, trying to be responsible citizens uh, to protect our students and our employees and our families uh, by applying the shelter in place uh, to our situation. Uh, as we did that, and we initially started looking at, well, what could we do to support our students? Uh, three words really came to mind, connect, engage, support, connect, engage, support. Um, our teachers have been nothing but miraculous, quite frankly, in the process of doing their best to connect with our students, the families, and to make sure that people are okay. Uh, and this all the while, while really having those personal responsibilities of taking care of their own families, their own children, uh, their own parents in some cases. Uh, and so really kind of just connecting as a community to make sure our students knew that we're here for you. Our parents know we're here for you. Uh, the engaging part was really through that first several weeks looking at how do we create a new opportunity to connect with our students through phone, through text, through email, through the internet, yes, uh, through some of the platforms that we had put together already in our classrooms. Um, however, we did not have a clear one-to-one -one initiative across the district or a full ability for all 30,000 of our students to connect uh, to all of our teachers every day. So that presented a challenge for us, a significant challenge. The support uh, really, again, is something that we did very quickly. Uh, one of the issues, and I'm going to jump for a second into our grab and go process, the food services. We knew that we have a number of students who rely and families who rely on getting food from schools every day. Uh, we know that there are food insecurities across our community. Uh, and so our child uh, food nutrition uh, director, Dominic Maki, uh, working with, again, our central services, our central office, uh, we created a plan that he was initiated that first week uh, to get meals to students uh, and it's evolved over time. 
Uh, so we have served close to 42,000 meals uh, just really in those first 13 days of no school. And then we continue the process through this spring break. We just concluded our spring break, but you wouldn't know it by the food service folks who are out there working and striving to get meals to our students. Uh, we will continue our food service program at, again, the five locations in Concord, but there are nine locations across the district. Um, in the sense, we're going to be going Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, providing food for the day and some food for the next day. Uh, so we're working to make sure that those systems are in place. I'm gonna go back to the extended learning platforms that we're looking at doing. Um, when we looked at, again, all of our 1,700 plus certificated employees who are serving our students, uh, we started addressing, well, what are the primary ways in which they're going to be able to connect with our students? Many of our teachers had already initiated Google Classrooms. This would be a way to share information uh, with students, with uh, families, uh, with lessons that go on through the year. Uh, so that is one of the primary platforms that we're looking to expand with our teaching staff. Again, when you change the dynamics of what an employee group will be doing overall, um, you really have to take into consideration the impacts on those individuals. And yet, we have to have uh, ways to connect with our students that are expansive uh, and get the most people connected to us. Uh, so we're looking at Google Classrooms. However, we're not just limiting it there. There are a number of different platforms that educators already use. Some use Class Dojo. Uh, some have been using Zoom. And again, we're taking precautions to make sure that we've got the right security in place for signing in and allowing people into those classrooms. Uh, because we want to make sure that they're safe for our students. Um, as we're now getting into the next 37 days, uh, and again, we took that step a few days ago to say, well, we're going to extend out to May 1st and now through the rest of the school year, just simply working with the governor's office, the state superintendent of public instructions office, California Department of Education, our county officials, Contra Costa County Office of Education, and the information from public health. What we saw is that given the need, again, to respond to the medical situation, while education for our students is an essential service, again, we knew we couldn't have on-site learning continue. And so we've had to, in essence, elevate well, what is going to be the platform? What are the expectations? In this unprecedented precedented time, uh, we can't just say school's the same. You're going to have six hours in front of a computer screen learning the way you might have in the classroom. So we've been working with our education staff, our uh, Mount Diablo Education Association, our own cabinet level folks, uh, and again, looking at all of the resources that we have from the state and across the nation to say, what's realistic for us? What's going to help our students continue to grow their skills, to receive feedback uh, that is uh, effective for them, that helps our parents uh, really continue learning for their students. Uh, because I know I've looked at the Facebook pages, it's overwhelming for many of our parents uh, to be able to take on this role. And that's not the intent. The intent is that as we look at this level of education, it's crisis education. It's something new that none of us planned for. And yet, we also want to be effective and efficient in helping our students continue to learn and grow. There is a wide variety and disparity among our ability to do that within a district as with other districts, quite frankly. Um, individual districts are looking at issues of equity. Do we have devices in students' hands? Do we have access through internet and hotspots so that people can actually engage? If we have this amazing program that is well honed and well tuned and we put it out there, but we're only connecting to 15 or 20% of our population, then we're missing the mark. So what we have to do is as we're getting into this next week, and starting to push out more education. Really the important piece for us was going to be a first, are we connecting? 
are we seeing the students? Are we finding ways to, to really have them engaged? Because if we're not, then we're going to have to rethink again and be nimble and flexible and figure out different ways. So that's one of the things we're doing. We have not been a district where we've had one-to-one -one devices in everybody's hands. That's just our harsh reality. So one of the things that we did is that we started deploying devices several weeks ago, and there have been over 5,000 devices that have gotten out into students' hands. And even then, we can't be assured that everybody is able to access the lessons that we have being provided by our educators. So we need to do a better job of figuring out, are people connecting? And if not, how can we help them get connected? So I won't tell you it's going to be perfect. I will tell you that our educators are rising to the challenge. I will tell you that we're working to engage and connect with our students in a supportive way. I will tell you that I have great faith and hope in the educational system uh, that will continue to support our students to the closure of this school year. The next step for us would be, of course, planning our summer school programs. Uh, and we have kind of two designs in place. One is if we can initiate an actual on-site program, what that might look like. And the second is if we cannot initiate an on-site program, we're going to have to have some connectedness through the summer. The educational implications for our students, we've heard from CDE, we've heard from the state, uh, from the governor's office, it's to hold students harmless. This has occurred to our students and to our families. Uh, it is really out of no fault of any of those students. And so what we're looking at doing, and we will be responding to this in our governing board meeting on Monday, is looking at the continuation of what happens for grading. Uh, many districts across the state have turned into the credit, no credit type of grading for the entire semester grade for secondary education, uh, you know, because we want to make sure and account for those credits for graduation for students. Uh, those students who are on track to graduate, we really don't have any indication that they won't be graduating. Uh, we want to make sure and continue to affirm that educational opportunities are out there and we're supporting that student through thriving to obtain the information they need uh, and what that looks like for those students that may not have that finished by June 3rd. Uh, what else would we need to do? We want them to receive their credits uh, under the guidelines that we have and the guidance we have from the state. For the students who are finishing eighth grade, for the students that are finishing elementary and moving to middle school, those are transitions that would normally take place. We don't see any indication that we would not have those transitions taking place. A number of people have asked about, well, what do you do about not having graduation ceremonies? And there's many different ideas that we're looking at closure for a student who has worked so hard uh, to obtain their high school diploma and wants to ascend to college or ascend into the work world or ascend into a trade school is really an important step. And I'll tell you, we don't have that exact answer right now. And it may be a varied level of response that, that comes back to meeting those students' needs. Uh, some have talked about virtual graduations could be an idea. Some have talked about extending and having something mid-summer and have students come back, could be an idea. So we're gonna work with, again, the realities that we have in front of us. Uh, we're going to work with the parents uh, that have concerns and we're gonna work really, again, under the timeline that's provided to us. We can't simply just toss something out there outside of the reality of what we're dealing with as a public uh, for the safety of the health of our communities. We have to work as part of that process. Uh, so again, I know that's a lot of information to give out there to you. Uh, what I want our public to really understand is we're going to be connecting again, engaging more, and trying to offer as many supports that we can uh, as a school district uh, to our students to their families, uh, to our employees. It's not lost upon us that again, this is striking every single family differently. Uh, our employees as well. Uh, we have been working with a very small uh, crew, but a mighty crew. Those food service workers who are continuing to come in. Uh, and again, 
that cognitive dissonance between being told you should be sheltering in place, you should be staying home, but again, they've been identified as an important essential service and they rise to the occasion. Uh, we're working as best we can to do everything to keep them safe um, and to keep the structural integrity of our district actually going forward as well. Uh, so there's many different layers here. Um, again, I've just been extremely impressed by the dedication of our employees, our educators, our support staff, uh, and really the responsiveness of our community. If individuals out there do not have devices, the best way to go about it is to get in touch with your principals. Get in touch with your principals. They are still working themselves. They are getting to sites. They are coordinating with their employees. And so if individuals need those devices, we want to know about it and we want to get it into their hands. Um, so I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Tim. But thank you so much for engaging with our district. Uh, the work that we're doing together uh, to support even our seniors out there, an amazing opportunity to connect. Uh, again, these types of meetings are very important for us because, again, our, our students are within our communities. They need to know the resources that are out there. And I thank you so much for offering to have me uh, be part of this. No, th thank you, Dr. Martinez. We appreciate you being on the call today. Um, this is definitely helpful. Again, it, it's an integral part. Everybody's trying to figure it out. I know that um, anybody with small children or, or, or school age children right now, um, it is a challenge. I mean, I know that firsthand trying to figure out kindergarten on a daily basis, um, which has been, you know, quite a challenge. Uh, luckily, the, the other two older ones are able to kind of, you know, self manage a little bit better. Um, but definitely for the younger ones, hey, this is this is something that, that's hitting home. And everybody's having to kind of stay on top of uh, your children. And, and hopefully, and we know it's not the same for everybody. There's a lot of there are resource issues. And I know that you and I have talked about that, trying to figure out how we can connect any other additional dots. Um, so again, I, I look forward to working with you in the future. We're going to do everything we can to hopefully help uh, fill any gaps and make sure that everybody has what they need. Um, I, I noticed that uh, there were a few comments that, that, that came in. One of them in particular was uh, Comcast, Verizon. There's definitely a few other internet providers that are out there that are offering um, some free internet services or ways to be able to connect at home. Um, and I'm sure that I think even Dr. Martinez, you, you've probably looked into that or have tried to help people connect on those resources. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some, some behind the scenes stuff around that? Sure. So uh, what we've uh, looked to do is a couple of different things. We have, again, uh, promoted the agreements uh, that Comcast has had out there that the other service providers have had. We actually have created another program that should be on our website that is for, again, low cost internet access. So individual families can go directly to this link that is provided to them by us in a partnership uh, with an organization which looks to support them. Uh, there have been some concerns concerns about individuals needing to have longer term agreements uh, for service providing. Uh, and so we just want to get the information about where we can help uh, our families connect. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at doing again through this next week is to strive to account for the students that we're actually seeing in our participating uh, with our distance learning programs. And if we have families that are not able to connect, what we're trying to do is work to potentially get hot spots out there uh, to support as well. So we're looking at different variety of ways to get people more connected. Uh, again, it is a challenge because we are cautious about not breaking any of the social distancing uh, structure. Uh, and so we have to then think about, well, if we are able to put a hotspot out there, do we have folks coming to an area to connect to that? But then we're putting them together. So it's kind of the plus and minuses, if you will, of trying to support. Uh, but we are uh, continuing our conversations with the providers, AT&T, uh, Xfinity, and, and what have you. Uh, me, some people have said it, right? It's really kind of one of those essential needs now of being able to connect. Uh, and so in a broader term, I think we will have to look at, you know, governmentally, you know, how do we provide this access in a greater opportunity for people who need this? School is essential, learning is essential. And so we have to make sure and get through some of these barriers to have people connect with us. Got it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Valerie, I think, did you um, have a question or two that you wanted to bring forward that you saw? Yes, I do. Um, so the question has been asked on the chat, 
on how are you reaching out to the homeless students and also how many homeless students are in your district? So I'll give you the rough numbers uh, because again, it's hard to account for that, but we do have still our student services group who is working to connect with our students. Uh, our data uh, identifies uh, really over about 800 students across our district who are categorized in this way. Uh, we also know that because one of the things with our district uh, services overall, we've been trying to target where our students are, what supports they need, how we best can keep them connected to school. Uh, so there actually are, a with our student services group, uh, reaching out uh, through some programs or through individuals where we do know where they can, they generally are uh, and going out into the community, again, in a safe way as best we can and really just trying to connect. Uh, so it's not as if we've simply said, well, you can't come to school, we're not gonna be able to connect. We're going out to where we know our students uh, tend to be and trying to get them uh, more information about staying connected. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions that have come in over chat, Valerie or Melissa? Those are the questions from the chat on um, the Zoom meeting. That's I it. don't know, Melissa, do you have access to Facebook Live? There was nothing on Facebook. We checked that one. So, and then anyway, in the audience right now, um, any, any questions from anyone at the moment? None? All right. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Martinez. I, I can't thank you enough. I also want to, you know, put a big shout out to our teachers um, and the staff um, who have also had to kind of figure this out um, on the fly. This has definitely added a, a different level of stress for a lot of people, but thank you for responding in the manner that, that you are. Um, and I also want to big, do a big shout out to um, Dominic Maki and your um, Central Kitchen staff as well. They yes. are one of the core components behind a lot of the food programs that are happening, specifically even our senior food program that we offer um, in our partnership. So thank you for making that available to us. Uh, that, is, that has had a huge impact. And um, the fact that that was available allowed us to be able to very quickly um, take care of that need. So thank you for that. Absolutely. They're a great group of people. Absolutely yeah. the heroes. Yeah, you have some good, good folks working with you there. All right. Well, thanks so much. And um, we'll go ahead and move on to a few more things here. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, of course, Concord Eats. And of course, it's not just Concord Eats, but it's Concord Eats and Concord Tree. And um, again, the, the, the uh, Greater, Chamber of, Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce and Visit Concord um, have the link to the Visit Concord website that does have the information about all those restaurants that are open right now. Um, and then of course we do get the questions about other essential businesses, but I'm, but I'm gonna let Kevin talk about that in his update next. So Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. If you wanna just um, uh, move to the next slide so people can get that link, I would really appreciate that. Um, Last week, we talked a lot about, about the PPP program. Thank you, that's perfect. Um, and, and so we did, we worked with a ton of small businesses this past week, helped them navigate through um, applying for their loan. Um, I still have not heard of anybody that's um, received any kind of money from a PPP or an EIDL loan. So if you have that information, if you could type it in chat, I would love to share that with some of our small businesses. Um, the process was fairly easy up until the point that you um, actually needed to upload it to the website. So please, if you're having issues still trying to process um, your information, feel free to reach out to us at the chamber, hit us through email or the website, um, or you can call us as we're monitoring, monitoring our phone all day long. So if I could have the next slide, please, Tim. Oh, that's it. Oh, nope, there it is. Um, where we're, our focus is adjusted just a little bit now is really putting the information out about essential businesses in Concord. Um, we think it's important that people know where to go, how to get a hold of these businesses. Um, a lot of our local businesses are getting creative on um, remaining relevant and in the mind of their customer. Uh, during this time, uh, we recognize the importance of that. So we're sharing information on all of our social media channels with um, uh, Facebook, 
um, Instagram and Twitter. So please follow us um, just to keep these businesses top of mind. So when this is over, um, we can make the adjustment swiftly and get these folks back to earning a living uh, and providing for their family and their employees. Um, we did go out and we have been posting the banners around about these essential workers in our community. You know, the, the real estate agents, the, um, you know, the public works folks, the Safeway employees, the grocery store employees, you know, these folks that are doing so much for our community and putting us, um, putting themselves um, out there uh, to help support our needs uh, on a daily. Um, I've gotten a couple comments from our smaller business owners um, with people coming in with masks. So just do them a service. And when you walk in, look at them and greet them um, because you're, you're, you're kind of hidden behind your mask. So we really want those people to feel comfortable. We want the rest of the patrons in the store at that time in proper distancing to feel comfortable as well. Um, so, you know, we appreciate the support from the community. We hope you're following us and uh, we're just here the, the chamber's role really is for us to provide support to local businesses and their employees. And we're doing everything we can uh, to do that. So I appreciate it, Tim. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin. I can't thank the chamber enough in terms of what they're doing right now. Um, I think I've mentioned it in past, past calls that um, I do have an opportunity to get together with the chamber, visit Concord and our economic development staff on a weekly basis just to monitor some of the different programs and things that are going on. I know economic development is trying to make sure that resources are going out as well. There's a lot, there's a lot happening out there right now and business owners are trying to scramble for information like you mentioned, the, 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 the Paycheck Protection Act. Um, that's something that a lot of people are trying to get figured out at the moment. And, um, and it's kind of one of those, all we can say is, hey, be patient. We know they're there. We know the resources are there. We're getting a lot of good information about it, meaning it's positive. Um, it's just when you have a million people uh, apply for it all at once, uh, that pipeline's only so big. So that's definitely some of the frustration. So it's just kind of, hey, you know, patience, and hopefully we can get this all figured out and uh, make this work. So again, thank you for your partnership. And again, it, you know, please, any, any other people that have issues around business-related concerns, either reach out to the chamber or our economic development department. Um, so next up, Thanks, we've Mary. got the, uh, we got Visit Concord and Elaine from Visit Concord. Do you want to go ahead and share some of the things that are going on? Yeah, great. Well, thanks again, everyone. And I, my heart goes out to everybody that's, uh, as we all get, get through this. So thank you again. Um, again, I just wanted to reiterate before we go through a bunch of fun things that we're, we're doing here is that the task of Visit Concord is really to market and promote the city of Concord, talk about all the great things to do and have people come back. So a lot of people are still unclear that uh, what is important is that uh, Visit Concord is funded by a pass-through tax. So this is the 3% tax um, from the hotels that the guest pays and not the hotels directly. Um, but that being in mind, it's so important that we're uh, you know, helping out everyone right now. Um, and we will be opening our brand new visitor center that, again, funded by the guests, but again, the help of all our Concord partners. So I just wanted to again thank the hotels that really have dynamically shifted. They've gone, you know, now they're filling up with essential workers and nurses and doctors. And, and again, we talked about the homeless that really has made it an absolutely great place. Um, uh, that they've been able to still stay in housing Concord. So again, if you need more resources on where like maybe a loved one that has to come uh, to Concord can stay, we can certainly help you with the state of solution. So um, go ahead with the next slide. So again, this is our time right now as we talk about things that we're doing, reconnect and rediscover. We've got family takeouts, we've got fun calendars, we've got story time. So we do have a lot of great stuff that's on our calendar that we like to talk about. Um, and also the banners that we're doing um, uh, with the city and the chamber around town. We'll be doing more banners that are, um, are for our hotels that are working so hard that are staying there night and day. We'll be having, uh, we'll be lifting uh, the look of the kiosks that are downtown and uh, making sure those share our, our conquered love. So for the next slide, please, Mayor. Oops. 
did I freeze? Or, yeah. Yeah, again, we are, you know, we want to be, say that we're still relaxed and recharged. Um, we are working on more things to do and constant things to do. Um, and we've got Color Me Conquered, check out a Disney movie, Conquered Live. Again, Lisa talked about that earlier with the City of Conquered, these really great events Thursday at six. And um, that's what we're doing is we're changing and evolving our calendar as we're moving towards virtual events. And we're just making sure that everything is a really great, um, you know, as best as it can be from home. So these are really important as we kind of are changing our plan to share the fact that we are going ahead and we're putting virtual events on our calendar. We're working with our key stakeholders with Zoom meetings, our nonprofits. We're just really getting the time to talk to them, you know, just at, figure out how to plan, how to do social media on these, because, you know, unfortunately, the fun things are sometimes the non-essential, um, but when we'll be back and running, we'll all be prepared for our recovery plan. Next slide. And again, more rewarding ourselves. We've got virtual spin, virtual yoga, shopping online, sewing, finding out more crafts to do. So as we're sitting at home and spending more time on our computer, we're going ahead and we're taking that time to really um, look around and see what else we can do in, and also thinking about our conquered uh, locations. Next slide. So again, yes, take the time, rejuvenate yourself. We're, we're staying at home, we're staying around our, our locations, we're staying safe, but again, we're working on our messaging, we're working on new videos, and we're really taking the time um, to look at this as an opportunity to rejuvenate ourselves, get back out there and, and make uh, Concord, Concord love and Concord proud. So thank you again. All right. Thanks so much. We appreciate that. And again, we can't thank you enough for the partnership with Visit Concord and the Concord Chamber of Commerce. So um, that does conclude our, uh, our update for the day. Thank you so much for everybody that has come on. I do have a few other, um, a few other updates as well that I wanted to bring. Uh, uh, Benny, you wanted to go ahead and kind of give a quick update about some things around child care. Um, and she's been on, on previous calls and, and has done a nice job about uh, bringing, bringing to the forefront some things around that. So do you mind giving us a quick update? Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm, I feel really proud to be a resident of Concord and thank you for everybody who's helping with everything. Um, I just wanted to give update on um, our child people, ch families that are looking for childcare actually that you could go to our local resource and referral agency. And I know Ms. Monica just uh, put it in the chat box about Coco Kids. So you can go on their homepage, which has a special button with application that directs essential working parents looking for childcare. And then Coco Kids resource and referral person will call them and give them the names of the family childcare homes or centers that, that are open to new children. And they could also call at nine to five 676-5442 and leave a message and they will be directed to the website or someone would call them back. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for that updated information. Um, and are there, are there any other questions or anything else um, for today? Uh, Tim, is George Fulmore, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, George, how you doing? Hi, good. I think Dr. Martinez is still uh, in the session. Uh, my question was uh, the consideration of not opening the schools in the fall until testing is available. Um, you, you open the schools, you get an outbreak. Uh, that's going to be a big turnaround. I wonder if uh, what is what is uh, feel, thinking is on that. Sure. Um, Dr. Martinez, you want to go and take that? Thank you for the question, George. Um, really, that's so far out right now. Uh, what we'll be doing is continuing to work under the direction of the public health officials, uh, quite frankly, uh, taking a look at what the guidance is from the California Department of Education, again, superintendent's office at the state level and the governor's office. Um, while we won't make the decision ourselves about coming back in or out, we'll be working in coordination and collaboration 
with everybody, quite frankly. Uh, we have to think a little bit about, well, what if, right? What does this present to us as a challenge for educators across the nation? Uh, if in fact we cannot resume just back to normal. Uh, and so, you know, I think what I would say would be, we'll be working on the what if possibilities. And again, how do we enhance all of our platforms to be able to provide education under whatever scenario we are asked to provide it? Uh, and, and it's gonna be a challenge, but uh, we'll work within, again, the experts and not just stand alone as a district. I don't think any district in California can do that. We'll have to work together uh, for the safety and security of our population uh, and the learning of our students. So time will tell a little bit on this one. All right, thank you for that. All right, well, any other questions before we go ahead and wrap up today? Well, it's George Fulmore again, uh, just seems like uh, the elephant in the room are renters in Concord that can't pay the rent. I, it seems like you're just avoiding that subject and uh, I, I would be happy if you'd say you're going to address that soon, Well, maybe at a council meeting or such. George, we've, we've addressed it uh, at about every instance, um, at about every meeting we've had, including have tried to make a lot of information available online um, and a number of different uh, helplines available as well. And so it's something that is, is definitely front of mind. I, I promise you uh, somehow we definitely have not forgot about it. Um, and I guarantee you every council member has, has been taking phone calls and helping direct people. I even yesterday, um, was working with a family. So uh, it is something that is, is very important to us. We're trying to stand up every resource we can to make sure that uh, people are being directed in the right manner. Of course, now the, the, other, the other issue is, of course, everybody's also just like business owners trying to figure out how to set up the PPA loans, which is a trickle down because then they can bring employees back um, and then helps everyone. We're trying to make sure that landlords understand what they can and can't do. And we also need to make sure renters understand what they can and can't do as well um, and how they're supposed to make, you know, notify their landlords, let people know what's going on. Um, and, and we know that there's going to be some angst around it. And so we're, our goal on, on this side is to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Um, so if there are specific instances, which I think is really more of the case, um, those are things where, hey, reach out to us individually. We're more than happy to help um, connect those dots. Um, and, and we're going to do everything we can to help support everyone, not just residential renters, but commercial, you know, the commercial tenants all the way across the board, because we are still in that space of flux right now. Um, everybody's still trying to pull the resources in and, and, and keep us going. And we have one more Facebook question. Yes. Um, we had a question on Facebook about what are, uh, let's see, what's Concord doing to remove barriers to build secondary housing units? Um, let's see, I believe uh, Joe online. Um, we're, we'd be more than ha happy to reach out to you about that. I know that we've talked in length about ADUs. Um, there's a number of different new guidelines around ADUs. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in doing, please out, reach out to our planning department. We can make sure that information is available. Valerie, do you want to go ahead and give maybe another guideline or best practice on around well, sure. their housing units? Sure. Um, so the Concord City Council has been working over the last few years to make ADU development easier. Um, prior to even the state law changes, um, the council uh, decreased the cost for applying for and obtaining ADUs, worked with the um, water district to get some discounts for them as well. Subsequently, of course, state laws are regularly changing. And so the city of Concord has seen, I think, about a doubling, maybe even a tripling of the number of ADU applications coming in. Um, and we are also moving forward with a grant that we got from the state to develop some standard pre-approved ADU plans that theoretically, if a, a homeowner wanted to develop one, they could um, come in, receive for free the pre-approved building plans and use that um, to build their project, which will also have a significant savings for them because they don't have to hi hire their own designer. They just have to make sure it fits and connects in with all of the utilities, et cetera, on the property. Um, so we're doing everything we can to facilitate ADUs. 
All right, thank you for that. And I believe that was uh, the last question. So again, thank you everybody for, for coming and, and participating today. We appreciate this. Like always, we're gonna go ahead and have another, uh, another session like this next Saturday. Um, any questions, any other uh, questions you may have or um, anyone else you'd like to go ahead and um, have us feature in one of these, please let me know. Go ahead and send, uh, send me an email or reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to go ahead and bring on some other guest speakers or, or some other resources that would be helpful to all of us here in Concord. So again, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, for all of those who are continuing to practice social distancing, we know that this is definitely uh, a challenging, has been, been a challenging week between um, Passover and Easter and of course Ramadan. So those different holidays that are happening, but um, I know that everybody just like, just like us are having to be creative in terms of uh, dinner over, uh, over a Skype meeting or, or, or a Zoom call. So with that, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mayor.